the Allen Brain Institute obviously was a pioneer in uh, looking at the neuroscience project uh, from a, a consumer's perspective, like what does the community need, and, and so do I. Uh, and in, I also think in terms of the penetration of the market, meaning that uh, who are the consumers that I want to uh, address? And uh, in my case, it's the neuroimagers. I also agree that an atlas will be used by and determined, you know, the, the evolution of an atlas will be actually determined by the user. So the, the need in neuroimaging, because um, in fact, I'll say most of, of all of our uh, clinical neuroscience relies on neuroimaging markers, uh, which are acquired non-invasively and are derived from MRI images. The problem with MRI images is that they really do not provide very high quality images. I mean, they provide high quality data, but the resolution is very low. So usually, you know, in a brain such as this, these are, like one could call them benign, benign lesions uh, that are age related. This was a normal, is a normal individual in his 80s. So there are the, what the radiologists would call hyper intensities here in this brain, which are regions in the white matter that are not probably as myelinated. We really don't know what is happening in the white matter, but these lesions are also dynamic. They appear and disappear over time. If you zoom in an MRI image, as you know, you know, 256 pixels square, you can really tell what's happening in these voxels. And the question is, why is this voxel, and in this image a pixel, bright and is considered a lesion? And why is this voxel considered normal at this gray level? So I set up my laboratory really to address these questions, and we, we have created a registry of individuals who participate to longitudinal neuroimaging, longitudinal MRI imaging, and they also uh, wield their brain to the program. So in the case, the, the, the project is called the Digital Brain Library, and some, some of our patients are in hospice care. So we have really worked with patients sometimes for a period of years or for a period of months. And of course, those who are in hospice care who are terminally ill, we're able to acquire the brain, however you know, ghoulish this may sound, but the validation of the images they acquired when they were living is, is usually done uh, over a period of few months. And so we, that's what we do. We, we, can you see the arrow here? Yeah. So this these are, these are the MRI data sets that we acquire from our individuals, and then we also do cadaveric scans. So when the patient dies, he's transported to our lab and we run another MRI on the cadaver, usually a few hours after death, which is you know, quali qualitatively at least uh, similar in terms of shape and uh, size and, and contrast to if, you, if, it's not, if the post-mortem interval is not too, too long. And then after several weeks of fixation in formaldehyde, uh, then the brain is imaged again ex situ. So I mean, out of the skull, we use a plexiglass chamber and we suspend the brain. So we get different kinds of resolution, but the most important thing is that we, we, we need to address the changes that occur f uh, in the brain, the geometric changes that occur when the brain is extracted. This is a, a big problem. There are two problems with working with humans. The brain is bigger, and uh, there is a lot of variability, and most of the work needs to be done post-mortem. So the, this is as far as I, I could go in trying to, to mimic the experimental paradigm of, that you use with experimental animals, you know, which is you know, essentially doing studies in vivo and then sacrifice the animal. We do not sacrifice our subjects. They, they die when they do. Uh, and uh, <laughs> even though I'm Italian, my cousins are not dispatched when uh, we need data. <laughs> Not normally, and this is and this is the well, unless it's a very important thing. And this is the different quality. Again, I'm talking about quality here. Quality of the images from uh, the you know a, a 1.5 T, a 3 T, and uh, eventually the X C. So I chose the cerebellum because, of course, the cerebellum has. Um, the scale of convolutions is much higher. Block face imaging, uh, Mike mentioned this modality, is, uh, is essentially imaging that is done on the brain specimen as it is cut. And we have extended this to actually slice the entire brain. And then histology, of course. So this is the, this is the, the type of... Uh, the, you know, the, the, the object of my study. And in my, uh, in my summary, I, I talked about the evolution of anatomy. I'm also trying to, to revisit classical dissections and create 
uh, essentially doing atlas indirectly in 3D the way classical anatomists would do it. Uh, uh, most of our nomenclature of classical anatomy derives from dissection that was done in 3D. You know, chiseling and uh, you, know, you know, the cross-sectional anatomy came later with histology. And I'll show you what we do. So just uh, briefly, you know, these brains are embedded in gelatin, they're frozen, and then we have a, a very beefy uh, microton machine that we also retrofitted to be able to cut whole frozen brains. And we, we essentially slice the brain in its entirety. It takes about 60 hours, in, uh, and we, we spread it over a week of work. And if the movie works, it makes for beautiful movies. Uh, I also wanted to mention that the other problem, as I said, dealing with human brains is variability. So the choice was not to create an atlas of the human brain. And the lady was asking this question. She actually very aptly pointed the put the emphasis on the. You know, we, these are human brains, and we can only really map a human brain. When you start working with another individual, your atlas is, uh, especially in the cerebral cortex, is very difficult. This is, the block face imaging is very good. It's sort of the inter, in between MRI and histology, because it gives you a three-dimensional data set, but with detail that is uh, pretty much almost histological, if you look at the classical definition of histology, which is, you know, comes from tissue. So we're looking at real tissue here. Vasculature is also nice. We try to reconstruct the vasculature. It's beautiful. You get this, uh, uh, this wonderful arborizations of vasculature. And here's the cerebellum, the spinal cord. Uh, and there is another disclaimer. Unfortunately, when I extract the brains, you know, at some point I have to make that fateful decision of cutting the spinal cord. And I always feel like uh, I'm picking a fruit and leaving the tree behind of the whole nervous system. One day, you know, of course, we will be able to map the entire CNS, but this is what we're doing. So we're, we're, we're studying the apple, not the entire organism here. And uh, now, this data is reconstructed in 3D. So remember, we're trying to get close to MRI, or in fact, have MRI be mappable on this anatomical data. So because MRI does not contain the detail that these volumes have. So, but we create volumes, and then the way that we actually also do this, uh, what I would call a physical tomography, I like it better than block face images when it comes to the whole specimen. Then we, we reconstruct the entire brain. This is a... I had to downsample. The data sets are about uh, 80 gigabytes uh, and uh, less if it's a black and white data set like this. Still, I had to downsample it to create this movie. So now we have a, essentially a monolithic uh, volume which is made from about 2,800 generally. Uh, and you, I also forgot to mention, we were cutting the brain coronally. For those who have some anatomy uh, knowledge, then they would have known that. But otherwise, and this is a, you know, once, once you have that data set, you can resample it or slice it whichever way you like. So I find this a good middle of the road. And now you see the hippocampus appearing. So this is what actually an anatomist would have seen when he was cutting a hemisphere open and, um, and opening it like that. But now we can, and this is, a, and now we can actually look at it uh, virtually. So that's why in my abstract, I, I really, I really do believe now anatomy has become a process of virtualization because you know, this is what we're doing now. And uh, the delineations are done in 3D. Then we do elastic registrations between modalities. Obviously, you know, we have these different acquisitions. We have the in vivo, we have the in vivo postmortem, we have the in ex situ postmortem. And the ex situ postmortem, uh, because as you saw in that picture of the brain in the bucket or the container, the brains are fixed suspended with a string. So to try not to you know, disrupt the, 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 the shape, but of course it's not the shape of the brain the way it was in the skull. Uh, if you don't suspend it by a string, the brain would, would be at the bottom and essentially you would have. And I've seen those and that's why I started my own brain bank because I saw some really ugly stuff. And you know, these are patients that who we know very well before they pass away. So, you know, once you know the person uh, well and then you're working with their brain, there is a certain uh, reverence, I would say, in the way you treat this specimen. And, uh, and that helps. That helps actually the quality. Uh, and as, the mod as technology will allow, just like now we can do a lot of this work, you know, with computers that cost about $6,000, Technology will help, but I think it will all come boil down to 
quality of the material, at least as far as histology is concerned. One problem about you know registering, you know, as Doug would tell you, uh, and anybody, even you know, even Mike uh, or Trigve, you know, if if the user has really bad histological sections full of tears or cracks, you know, the atlas cannot do miracles and that would create many errors. So I think really the emphasis is going to be for the user to create very high quality material. And then the user, the, the researcher, the neuroscientist can outsource a lot of the neuroinformatics, which I would be very happy to do because it's very expensive. And this is, for example, some other things we tried, like to see, you know, the brain shrinks in formalin, we know, not by a lot. At the end of our process, actually, our frozen brains, we calculated an overall shrinkage of about 5-6%. So when you do this process, you don't have a lot of changes. If we had embedded in paraffin, then the shrinkage would have been probably close to between 50 and 60%, because paraffin embedding dehydrates the brain as a whole, and then you slice it. The only dehydration that happens in our case is when the slices are then mounted on glass, and of course, just like a sponge drying, it, uh, it loses. So we go from 70 to about 15 microns in, uh, in thickness. So here, for example, are other things. So what do we want to do? We want to essentially allow brain mappers... Uh, am I, I'm at the wrong conference here. I should have been the human brain mapping. <laughs> but, you know, those brain mappers who really cannot see very well where they are and they consult atlases that don't really match their, their data or their images, there are very, many tricky areas in the brain. The border between the hippocampus and the amygdala is very tricky, for example. So imagine all of the thousands of papers and, uh, and millions of dollars spent to find neuroimaging markers that rely on quantitative analysis of specific structures, like we know Alzheimer's disease, the size of the hippocampus, what does really mean? How did they do that? How did they delineate the hippocampus? What precisions? And precision in this case, reliability is in numbers. That's why these projects are growing and, and we need 1,200 patients to be, to be processed so that you get a better certainty. In our case, you know, we only have you know, we're, we're working in the two or three digits in terms of our N sample size. But, you know, you see, we, we applied, for example, are you familiar with FreeSurfer? It's a, it's a software that allows you to, to essentially create a surface, uh, model the cortical surface, um, uh, calculate cortical thickness in different regions, and also delineate your brain. And it's a tool, or at least a module called ASEG in FreeSurfer. So we're trying these tools on the block face image. We have to downsample our block face image and then re-upsample re it again. And, the, for example, one of the questions I was interested in is, you know, what is cortical thickness? And here, for example, we see a, a free surfer anatomical labeling of a block face volume. So this is actually a automated labeling uh, atlasing, you could say, on an anatomical specimen. And from there, of course, we can translate this to the histological images. So th there's my anchor. My, uh, rather than uh, uh, because also I think it's more difficult, it takes more time. But, you know, I had to choose an anchor for these data sets in terms of atlasing, and I think because of the, of the sheer amount of users that use FreeSurfer, I thought, okay, I'm going to use the list of labels that FreeSurfer generates for a given data set and apply that to create an atlas from a post-mortem brain and then validate boundaries and eventually kind of refine this atlas. But the users are brain mappers, and so... And one of my main questions was, what is cortical thickness? You know, MRI, uh, T1-weighted MRI looks at uh, myelination. So when uh, we see, and this was also seen in the beginning of the 20th century, but, you know, with age, the fibers that, the myelinated fibers that enter the cerebral cortex begin to actually um, degrade or we don't see that much myelination in an older individual. So the question is, if Free Surfer tells us that an older individual has a thinner cortex, uh, does it, it does it underestimate the cortex? So in this way, we can apply free surfer mapping and then look at the homologous histology. And, you know, I was talking about slices and quality, so here is what, uh, what you really need to do. Uh, once you have taken these slices, you have to flatten them on glass. Uh, now, a mouse stays together a little better. I'd rather work with the human brains because they're bigger. Uh, you know, working with the mouse is, is harder because you really don't see what you're doing. The, the complexity of the human slice is because it's very convoluted. The gelatin helps a little, but still imagine, you know, I'm being very candid here, imagine the, 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 the kind of distortions you can apply at this stage. 
And this is probably one of the stages that would be very hard to, uh, to automate, or, although there are tape systems that work pretty well, but those in, uh, in introduce cracks. And uh, so this is what we do also, because we like to pretend we're artists and we, we have our brushes. And it, it takes a long time. I mean, this is the other problem. So what we decided to do is to slice brains and we have a way to, the block face images, of course, allow us to have a, a digital record of every slice that then is going to be peeled, sliced off. So we know exactly where in the freezers any particular structure is. So now we're at the stage in which we're creating the tissue bank, but we can then choose from different patients looking at the block face scroll which slices we want to compare and do this type of work. And then we digitize them. We, you know, even then, the technology has caught up with us. We had built these systems back in 2008. They were to digitize. We had to build them because there were no available scanners at the time to do a 20x magnification scan on uh, very large slices. Now there is a company, Huron, who is actually displaying there, and I'm so happy about that because this took a lot of money to create, and also it, this can take several hours, while they promised to do it in, a, in half an hour, I think. You know, it's very, very fast. So you see, you can outsource a lot of your work, uh, but I think that the emphasis will be for the anatomist uh, is to have good quality slices. So remember that voxel in the white matter. So now we have that brain, but we have, we have cut and we have stained sections in the region of that, uh, of that lesion. Because the beauty about the block phase volume, once you register with the MRI, you can actually map very precisely. Because we know which slices go through that particular point in 3D. The MRIs are one millimeter cube. The block phase volume is uh, uh, 30, no, 40, 40 by 70 microns. So that's the size of the voxel in our body. So imagine, we're at the cellular. We can really tell, provided funding and, uh, you know, it's a matter of time. But if you asked us, where is that cell in the MRI? We can actually find it because our block phase volume is, has that enough resolution to localize a single cell, of course, from the, by processing histological slides. And this is how we do it. You know, essentially, we stain the whole slides after they're mounted on glass. And then, of course, we, we, we zoom in and we can look at any. And so this is what was happening in that gray pixel that we saw before. And this, I think, is very important gradually as a program to validate these neuroimaging markers. And uh, yes, the resolution that we have on the scans, which I call the landscape view, and now we're back in 2D. Uh, this is about 0 0.37 microns per pixel when they're digitized at 20x. And, of course, this is like a big ball of spaghetti, so what we did is I also started trying to determine what makes some sense algorithmically uh, of, the, of the direction of these axons, eventually to be able to create a connectome map, but at the histological level. Again, imagine this image is made of about 60,000 tiles, and we were here processing one tile only. So it's a really a very high intensive computation. So as a matter of just money and time, really, to get to the point. And we are at the mesoscale. And so if, to, to conclude, you know, there is and there's a very interesting uh, 3D printing also allows us then, you know, our brains are sliced. They're not, uh, we cannot have a menagerie and have all the brains of our, um, of our individuals in the, like books in our library. But, you know, now we're using 3D printers to actually regenerate the, because I also believe that eventually probably the, the haptic component and the 3D printing would help also understand where atrophy is and uh, we, we can go back to actually enable uh, a very, uh, a more complete examination of the brain. So we're back into the 3D model. Now, here we're seeing a model of the cerebral cortex, but of course, you can create models of different structures or even, even individual neurons if you wanted to. And, and here is my contact information if you need to, if you want to write. Uh, very simple. I have an appendix to the talk. Uh, because you mentioned HM, so I didn't want to put it in the talk, but if you... Um, uh, two minutes. Uh, oh, forget it. <laughs> you do you want to hear a little bit what we did with HM? Okay. Well, this is an applicant. <laughs> no, it's very brief. It's very brief. Plus, now, after this, they don't want lunch anyway. So, <laughs> I did it on purpose. 
So if anybody knows who HM is, and the project is concluded, we are uh, now sort of disengaging from it. Uh, and HM was an amnesia, here is, here is HM on the left, when, at, probably at the age when he, bef just before he had his surgery, he suffered from epilepsy, this is the 50s, and uh, he lived in Hartford, Connecticut. At the time, there was a very well-known uh, surgeon, William Beecher Scoville, who was in the School of Psychosurgery and proposed to do an experimental lo lobectomy. Uh, and so essentially he had worked on uh, other psychotic, psychotic patients who had seizures and by removing the, the medial temporal lobe structures, uh, so I, the hippocampus, he thought, then this uh, epileptic seizure subsided. Now the problem was the patients that he worked with before, they were psychotic, so nobody really knew what happened to the rest of their mind. Uh, but HM actually, when he, when he woke up after the operation, then he could not make new memories essentially, and he had lost about 11 years of his uh, retrograde uh, of his, of his uh, life. So he had a very, he developed a very pervasive and pure um, anterograde amnesia, and then he had about 11 years of retrograde amnesia. So the question was. You know, this is, the, this is the drawings of the method that Scoville used. He, he lifted, you know, HM would be lying here, uh, not, you know, not in anesthesia, but essentially uh, he drew, uh, he cut two holes on the frontal poles and then used the spatula to lift the frontal lobe like that and then used the scalpel to cut the temporal pole and then a suction tube to remove tissue. So really vacuuming his medial temporal lobes. He was that crude. So the goal of the project was to understand really what happened in the brain. And we used this technique, in fact, this were the beginning, this is 2008, 2009, when we started working on this project. So really what we developed for this project then became common practice in our lab. But the technology and instrumentation was really built for HM. And you know, so we cut, as you saw, uh, coronally, and then you generate this uh, block face volume. And then we had to do some image adjustment. And these are all fun things to do. And that the beauty, again, is that I like the idea that these data sets, because they're, they're stored, they're preserved, they will be somebody else who has a better uh, you know, image correction algorithm, and they'll be very glad to make these data sets available to them, let alone you know, giving these data sets to other people to create adults from. Because I have a lot of patients to keep up with and they call me all the time, so I have no time for atlasing anymore. And so this is, a, this is what, what um, we were talking about, you know, doing delineations in 3D. So what we actually, and for HM in particular, because we needed to know what was happening, what had happened 50 years previously in the temporal lobe, I wanted to do that in 3D. If we had just taken a sparse, you know, series of section or done a normal neuropathological examination, then I think we wouldn't have been able to really understand, to recreate virtually the surgery, which is what I wanted to do. And this is, we actually discovered that there was a very significant portion of the hippocampus that was preserved in HM, and uh, this was done, this is, was published in Nature Communications in January. And, uh, and this gave us a quantitative, and essentially, uh, view of the uh, HM spared hippocampus. And this is how we did it, you know, from the data set, you just delineate on different orientations. So you correct your delineation as you go along, because once you check in another plane, then you see the mistakes you've done. And you, it's, it's great to look at structures in 3D. And, and eventually then we looked at the histological, um, uh, what did that spared hippocampus look like? And, and it was great to see that actually it looked, uh, it looked viable functionally. Of course, we could not make the statement that it was working or how it was working, but the, the look, the histological look of this, um, of this tissue is certainly viable. So this is very important in the field because, you know, for 50 years and over 2,000 publications, it was assumed that HMs didn't have any hippocampus or there was a little bit left and it wasn't, it was really atrophic. So again, how 3D histology, 3D mapping, but, but I think the, as a renaissance of anatomy, how anatomy allowed really to, to revisit this case. And if you go on the Brain Observatory website, there is a link to the atlas, an online atlas of the brain of HM. And this is where you can uh, look at uh, not only the scroll of the block face images, but you can navigate because these slides have been digitized at 20x. You can actually go and look at different parts of the brain. And as I said, this was a big ordeal to create then. 
if the project had started five years later, it would have costed less than half. Uh, but now we can just generate slides and just essentially digitize them in, uh, in, in one-tenth of the time it took us and one-tenth of the money. But I encourage you to go to the Brain Observer. We still have a kind of a commemorative uh, website for HM. I don't know if this will load. Yeah. So because it's all in honor of the hippocampus, this is what our, what our website looks like now. Uh, but there is a link to, to, the, to the atlas, and so you can kind of roam around. And again, delineation, we use the Paxinos terminology, but of course, like uh, Mike said, you know, there may be different skins, different layers that will be then applied to this data. Okay, thank you very much, Jacopo. Thank you. <laughs>